All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think we should get started on time today because we I, I, we didn't finish last week. So I still have a few things about last week, which I'd like to finish. Um, first of all, a few updates, because there have been a few questions, which uh, I promised I'd look up. The one was, maybe you remember this graph of how much energy different different technologies use. And I think, Pavel, you asked if how it's 4G. So I couldn't find exact numbers, so this is an estimate, but it will behave very similar to the rest. So the initial, initial st startup cost will be higher if you transfer very small amounts of data, but if you transfer bigger amounts, they will uh, go up very slowly compared to 3G, for example, because the transmission will simply be over uh, in, in a much shorter time frame. And so the total energy that you use will at some point be, uh, be lower with, uh, with 4G. Uh, so that's, again, that's not an exact number right now because the, the original test didn't, um, didn't include 4Gs uh, and uh, they probably haven't repeated it, but as a rough estimate, uh, this, this might give you an idea. Um, or I've also updated these uh, in Moodle, so um, maybe it's a good idea uh, if you download the slides that from time to time you look if I've updated them. I don't know if you can actually see that in Moodle somehow, but um, I'm, I'm trying to keep them keep them up to date. Okay, so that's, that's Then next up would be a little bit about networks again. We've already been through this. I've also uh, found a, a better explanation of how Bluetooth and Wi-Fi coexist. I think that was a question also from last time. So um, I've mentioned this already that Bluetooth uses both use spread spectrum techniques, so they use a wider range of spectrum than they actually need, but they do that in quite different ways. So Bluetooth actually just uses very small channels, but many of them and hops between them frequently at a, at a high rate. Um, Wi-Fi, on the other hand, uses uh, such a digital spread spectrum technique um, which results in a very wide usage of bandwidth, but uh, basically at lower energy, exactly. And now if you, if you lay them on top of each other, you can already see that um, they will interfere, but it's not, not that big of a problem because um, um, even if you get one Bluetooth transmission, then you will probably still be able to recover the entire Wi-Fi signal because it's spread out over, over a much wider range. And you will only get this, this interference uh, for a very short time because then Bluetooth has already switched on to the, next, uh, to the next channel. And if you have some kind of integrated transceiver, then you can even do uh, this. Then the Bluetooth uh, transceiver will simply avoid the channel on which the Wi-Fi is currently uh, running and will basically hop, hop around that channel so you don't ideally get any interference at all. So that's the, the idea be behind these different modulation techniques. And because, so if Bluetooth would also use direct sequence spread spectrum, then you would need two different channels. But since they use um, um, completely different modulation techniques, you can use them more or less on the same channel without getting too much problems. Okay, uh, and now I'd like to continue with what we actually skipped. Uh, last week, so I have to skip ahead for a bit. Uh, somewhere below here, no. We've already been through this. Exactly. So what I'd like to, to add to the stuff from last week is a bit of a discussion of how location and networks uh, connect together. So. We talked about physical location last time for a while. Uh, today we'll talk about network location. So this is used what the network in, in its entirety uses to route 
uh, data or uh, phone calls. And this is similar to cell-based location. So you need to know basically which access point, which base station I need to send the data to so that it then can be delivered to the, uh, to the user's uh, device. And that yeah, might be the idea of, of a cell tower just as in a network location, or it might be the, the address of, of the access point. Um, the big issue here is that um, until now, we were always looking for our own location. Now, with network location, you actually need to know the location of the other device which you want to communicate with. And uh, uh, this, in basically, traditionally, in a wired network, this was simply done with uh, broadcasts. So um, you basically asked all devices in the network who has address so and so, and then the right device would answer, oh, it's me, please deliver your data to me. Um, and of course, that wouldn't work at all in a global network uh, like, like the internet, so you couldn't use a broadcast to, uh, to find a device which is on the other side of the globe, basically, because then the network would simply be flooded all the time by broadcasts. Um, so that's not an option, and we need to find something, something different. So one example of how this is solved is in UMTS or also GSM, similar concept, and as far as I know, also LTE, so that hasn't really changed, that we have so-called location registers. So there's a home location register, and if you buy a new SIM card, then uh, it's more or less randomly assigned to a home location register. Uh, usually it's the one for the town where you bought the card, for example, or where you first activated it. And um, on the other hand, we have the visitor location register, which is uh, keeping track of devices which are from a different town, basically. So which are in a register to a network that is not connected to their um, home location register. So if you remember this uh, slightly complex uh, graphic, then we have Somewhere here in the core network, we have the home location register, which collects data for uh, yeah, devices which are mm, basically uh, associated with that network. And then for uh, every mobile switching center, so which serves a couple of base stations together, we have the visitor location register. And uh, so the basic process now is um, if I want to initiate a connection to another device, then the network first attempts to look up that device in the visitor location register. So it tries to see, is it in the, the same city where you are? Because that's actually often, uh, most calls are within the same general area because you're calling a friend to see if uh, they want to come over for dinner or something. And, um, so most of the time you can actually find the correct device already by looking it up in the visitor location register because it's in the same area. If you don't find it in the VLR, then you have to contact the home location register and that will basically then tell you which other visitor location register to contact. And the, um, the idea is that you don't have to do, do as many updates in the home location register because if you would keep track of all devices within one database, the home location register, then you would get, would get an insane amount of, of connections and queries to that database. And to spread out the load over, over more servers, basically these visitor location registers are used, um, which can, can deal with just one area and only if you want to connect the device which is in another area, then you will have to also uh, contact the, the HLR. Um, so now, how does it look like with, uh, so this is UMTS basically, this is still kind of emulating the old telephone network. How does it look like if you're just uh, trying to communicate over IP? And the original internet protocol, this is quite old already, um, relies on static routes or at least routes which don't change um, very often. And the IP address actually has two different, uh, different tasks. On the one hand, IP address is unique, so it 
uniquely identifies a specific host, a specific device, but it also contains routing information. So if you remember, IP addresses are usually grouped into, at least the old ones are grouped into four, uh, uh, four numbers. And um, very roughly, each number tells you the, the big network which you need to contact first, and then uh, the next smaller number tells you the subnetwork and so on. Um, but the problem now here is that a mobile device can quite quickly move to a different subnet. So if I drive to a different city, for example, then it will be in a different subnet. And then in theory, I would have to update all the IP routes all over the globe to just accommodate that one single device moving to a different net, and that's uh, not a good idea. With wireless uh, local area networks, that's not such a big deal because they are local, so you can still keep track of the, the routes for maybe 100 devices which are uh, in, in the building or something like that, so that's not such a big issue, but once you switch to wide area networks, then you have thousands and, or, or millions of devices and you can't update the routes for all of them all of the time. Um, so I don't know how familiar you are with IP routing. Uh, anyone's ever come in contact with that? Okay, um, maybe half of it. So let's just briefly go through how, how that such a such a regular routing process would look like. Yes, please. Uh, one question. Mm -hmm. what, what is the problem since like so a mobile would have of course like when it's in a different city it would have different IP because IP is uniquely but I mean I would assume that when we get into different networks we will have new IPs and then basically why it's an yeah, if you get, but if you get a new IP, of course, that's a possibility. But then, um, uh, so even, even if you just switch to a different cell tower, maybe, and if it's, just, uh, if it's right at the border between two areas, for example, then your device gets a new IP, and then all of your connections are gone. Then, because you, then you would, usually you want to keep the same IP for the device, of course, because otherwise all connections would break as soon as you switch to a new cell tower or to a new area. And for that reason, uh, it's not possible to just assign a new IP. With wireless networks, that's usually accepted because if you close to your laptop, then the connections are, are shut down anyway, and then you move to a different building and open it up again. So that's acceptable, basically. But for mobile devices, if you're in the car and uh, talking to someone or on the train maybe, and then just suddenly your connection breaks because you switch to a different network, that would annoy people quite a lot, I guess. Right, exactly. So right now I'm talking about IP communication and you can also have IP communication on 3G, of course. Um, but uh, with 4G, it's actually a little simpler in the long run, because the entire network is based on IP. Um, with 3G, it's this weird mix. Uh, because that's also why you, for example, need those location registers in parallel to the IP routing. OK, so let's look at this example briefly. So we have a network of different hosts, and we have the mobile host, which is uh, host F over here, which is connected wirelessly to this node. And now node C wants to send some data to the mobile device. So, um, whoops, <laughs> that was a little too fast. So the idea is, first of all, I look into the routing table, and the routing table always tells me if I want to reach this target or this target, then I have to connect to some other host. And usually you have uh, catch all entry for everything else, contact host D. So it's the data I want to send isn't uh, for A or B, so it's something else, and I have to send it to D. Um, from D, it's then again, we look into the routing table. Uh, is it for H or I? No, it's something else, so I have to contact E. Next up would be, okay, uh, I want to connect to host F, um, so I have to contact G. Data is forwarded to G, and on host G, then I have the direct connection to F, and the data is sent to F. 
so far so good. That's how regular IP works. Now the problem is when the mobile device moves and moves to a different subnet, then suddenly all of these routing tables would have to be updated. So uh, this one is now wrong, of course. This one is also wrong, so at least two different hosts in this very simple example would need updated routing tables. And uh, in a much bigger network, of course, it would get much more complex. And that's the reason why, why we have kind of a problem here. Um, does anyone have an idea how this is, is solved in real mobile networks? Yeah? Mm -hmm. For example, when um, it's shorter to go from C to D, but maybe uh, the, there's so much traffic in mm -hmm. C and D that it's faster to send it to A and then to B and then to mm -hmm. D. Yeah, that's also a, a possibility that's used for, I think that's more or less used for like very uh, big connections between data centers and so on. So. I'm not sure, as maybe this is uh, used internally within the mobile network, of course, because they have lots of data between different, different uh, uh, mobile switching centers, for example. Um, I think it's not so much used for actually directly connecting the mobile device. Um, there's, uh, actually, there's a much simpler trick. So from the point of view of the internet, um, each device simply gets a static address, a so-called care of address, and um, that kind of separates the identity of the device, that's the care of address, which always remains static, um, from the routing information, which is then handled internally by the network. So the, uh, from when, you, when you send IP data from the internet to a mobile device, then you send it actually to a static address, which is some server uh, belonging to the phone company, which is of course, doesn't change, so the routes don't have to change, uh, at least not often. And uh, internally, the uh, network does, for example, the lookup again via home location register and so on to actually deliver the data internally to the mobile device. So um, internally, the network might still use IP, but they can, uh, they can actually optimize their own routing tables, um, for example, to uh, deal with the, uh, with the moving devices, and you don't have to actually update routing tables all over the internet to, to deal with this. Um, the only time this might be a problem is when you actually move to a different provider. So if you have roaming uh, in your contract and uh, your current provider doesn't offer coverage for the area where you are, and you actually have to switch to a different provider because then usually the care of address will change because uh, the providers, from the, from the point of view of the internet, basically, they have different subnets, different addresses, and then you will get a different public IP address. But that's the only scenario where this uh, breaks. And within the network of your own provider, or at least of the same provider, you can switch between cell towers and so on without changing the, the public uh, address. Uh, yeah, question. Um, well, in, internally, uh, the, uh, the provider usually has full access to that data. So what you, what you, when, you, when you really want privacy also from your provider, then you need end-to-end uh, -end encryption. That's the, the term, maybe you've heard it in the context of WhatsApp recently. And that means that uh, the entire encryption is done on the devices at each end. And um, um, yeah, the data is completely encrypted all the time because the, the provider usually has full access to your data and 
you can't really tell for sure what they will do with that data. If they will analyze it for some marketing stuff or if they will pass it on to the secret service, nobody knows. So um, if you really want privacy for your data, then you definitely need end-to-end -end encryption. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Yeah? E Skype uh, does encryption, but it's only encrypted basically from your device to the Skype server. So the provider can't look at it, but, the, but Skype itself, they can. So a little better, but not, not much better, actually. <coughs> okay, so just to summarize, um, there's a difference between network location and physical location which is important to keep uh, in mind, I think. Um, we have these location registers, which are a part of UMTS, which are still part of LTE, but uh, it's a little less complex because internally, as I've already mentioned, LTE um, relies on IP. So these are more or less simply big routers, which also try to keep track of the devices. And uh, usually an IP address has two purposes, identity and routing. And to separate these two to um, deal with moving devices, uh, usually this kind of static care of address um, is used. Um, are there any more questions relating to this topic? Um, one more thing maybe worth mentioning is that uh, IP6 actually has lots of built-in provisions for dealing with um, mobile devices, but most of the time uh, the providers simply haven't switched yet. So you're, they're still using IP4 internally, and so all this, uh, this stuff is still required to, to deal with IP4 um, devices. IP6 actually uh, could, in theory, give you a valid global IP address, which stays the same for your mobile device and which moves along with your device as you, as you switch networks. But it's not really, uh, really used in, in practice currently, at least not as far as I know. Okay, so then we're done with what uh, we should have f finished 